Don Marquis makes an argument that abortion is immoral in almost all circumstances. And we are looking at his rationale in this video. So the thesis and typical assumptions of Marquis. First of all, his thesis is that abortion is seriously immoral, except possibly in rare cases. Now we won't talk in particular about those rare cases. Instead, we will focus on his view that abortion is seriously immoral. So Marquis argues that abortion is comparable to killing an innocent adult human being. And he says that there is a crucial assumption that is typically shared by many authors of, uh, on the topic of abortion on various sides of the issue. The issue of the morality of abortion, Marquis argues, depends on whether or not a fetus is the sort of being whose life is seriously wrong to end. Now, often this leads to discussions of personhood, whether or not a fetus is a person, or whether or not a fetus is a human, and those are two different things. And so we'll see how this plays out according to Marquis. So a typical anti-abortion or what we might call pro-life argument says that life is present at conception with the genetic code of a human. Now that's clearly a biological fact. Then it goes on to argue fetuses look like babies and are humans. Well, at a certain stage, maybe that's true. And the argument claims that these things are obvious and therefore abortion is akin to murder. A typical pro-choice argument says that fetuses are not persons, or maybe it's based on the claim that they are not rational or they are not social being. And both of those factors, being rational or being a social being, then it would be considered crucial for being a person. Or they may combine any of these claims and then say that this truth is obvious or all the truths are obvious, and therefore abortion is not a wrongful killing. Those are the typical ways that Marquis views the arguments being presented. Now, Marquis evaluates both of these typical arguments and says they're both mistaken. They both have premises, though, that seem to be true, it seems plausible when you look at either argument, but both need some kind of further general moral principle to go from the claims that are being made in the premises to get to the conclusion that is drawn. So, for example, the anti-abortion or pro-life argument, it needs an assumption that it's always prima facie wrong to terminate human life. By the way, that phrase prima facie, it means on the surface or uh, apparently wrong. Uh, when you first think about it, it seems wrong to terminate human life, and uh, this is obvious. Now, for the pro-choice argument, it needs a further assumption as well, and the assumption needed there is that being a person is what gives an individual intrinsic worth. Now, typical of the general principles of anti-abortion and pro-life positions are too broad. These are too broad. They, Marquis argues they would include human cancer cells. If it's always wrong to kill or destroy human life, well, human cancer cells are human life. But those of the pro-choice argument are too narrow because babies are not necessarily rational, or even toddlers possibly, or the mentally deficient are not rational, or sometimes may not be social beings for someone that's uh, severely autistic, for example. So those would allow then the killing of those types of humans. 
And Marquis argues that the attempts to remedy the deficiencies of both sides fail. And so he explores a third possible way of thinking about the abortion debate. And he says that maybe a better route is to speak about rights and obligations that are then rooted in psychological characteristics. And this is the approach that Feinberg takes, another philosopher. And Feinberg argues that having goals, plans, desires, values, expectations, and essentially consciousness, are, these are the central features of beings who have rights. So if a being has rights, then it's going to have all of these features. And if the fetus lacks these features, then it lacks rights. And so this would give an impetus for a pro-choice argument. However, Marquis argues, we don't believe that that's all there is to it, that that's not the only thing that is included for beings who have rights. So for example, our courts recognize the rights of babies who may not have goals, plans, values, expectations, etc. We also recognize the rights of the senile, the comatose, and others who may lack those attributes. So we certainly as a society don't think that beings who lack some of these things completely lack rights. So Feinberg's criteria don't seem to succeed either in being the determining factor in whether or not it's acceptable to terminate the life of such a being. So the problem with the dialogue, according to Marquis, and this is kind of a meta-diagnosis uh, philosophical assessment of where we're at with the abortion debate, he says it's easy to believe that the apparent counterexamples to one's own positions are mere temporary difficulties that will be shown mistaken upon reflection. So once you are pretty entrenched in a position and somebody provides a counterexample to your view, apparently showing that the view is incorrect, the idea is that you would respond by thinking, well, it's a temporary difficulty, we can overcome it, just need to tweak it a little bit and everything will be fine. Whereas the counterexamples to the opponent's position will lead to the eventual downfall of their claim. So we think, well, we see this counterexample to somebody else's view, and it's so obviously problematic and devastating that there's no way their view uh, can be shown to be rational given that counterexample. Now, this is actually the case, I would say, with almost any philosophical position that people become sometimes entrenched in what they believe and are resistant to change their beliefs and have this idea about counterexamples when shown problems. So it's certainly true of the abortion debate. Now, Marquis says, well, in order to resolve the problem, we need to assess why we all think certain basic moral principles are true. So Marquis says, we need to step back from arguing whether or not being a human is the significant thing or being a, a person is the significant thing because both of those will lead to something problematic. Um, instead, we should step back and ask a question such as, why is it immoral to kill you or me? Why is it immoral to kill an innocent adult human being? And he says, first of all, we can rule a couple things out. It's not immoral because it harms the perpetrator, right? It's not immoral because it's a problem for the person doing the killing, although it may be. And it's not immoral because of the people who are harmed because they care for the victim, even though that may also be true. But that's not getting at the key thing. Neither Both of those things might be true that it harms the perpetrator, and it might be true that it, it harms the people who care for the, the victim, the one killed, but those aren't getting at the essential reason why it's immoral to kill you or me. What Marquis says is the loss of life is the greatest loss that one can suffer. 
it is the loss of the activities, the projects, the experiences, the enjoyments that we otherwise would have had that makes the killing immoral. And so, in other words, um, he uses this phrase, it's the deprivation of a future life like ours that is the problem. When someone is killed, an innocent person is killed, that was an immoral action because someone has deprived that individual of a future life like ours, a life that includes activities, projects, experiences, enjoyments, th the things that give life value. And it's this loss of a future with life like that that constitutes the serious wrongness in a killing. So Marquis says, when we assess why it's wrong to kill an adult, we have these different characteristics that we need to take into consideration. So the wrongness of the deprivation of a future life like ours, he says, it's, you can tell that this is the right thing to be focusing on because it also has explanatory value. It explains a few other things. It explains why we think that killing is one of the worst crimes. Right, uh, There are very few things that might raise to a capital offense on a legal system, and murder is one of them. It also explains why we think that a diagnosis of a terminal illness is so bad, or the terminal illness itself is so bad. Right, It's one of the worst things you could hear when you go to a physician, a diagnosis of cancer or uh, some other illness that would be terminal. It also explains why it's seriously wrong to kill infants and children, because they have a future like ours. And in fact, we often grieve even more so when it's uh, infant or children. So a school shooting, for example, at an elementary school, all the more uh, stirs up grief because they had all the more future in front of them, and so it makes it even more wrong, it seems, to many people. And finally, uh, it, the deprivation of a future like ours, uh, that being the wrong part of it, explains why it may be wrong to kill other species who may have a future similar to that of a, an adult human. So there might be other uh, extraterrestrials who are intelligent, and they would also have plans, desires, hopes, et cetera. So that might explain why it would be wrong to kill them. It also, if you think that androids could have minds and actually have those mental capacities of having plans and desires and, and hopes and goals in, in their life, so to speak, if you believe that, then terminating an android with those characteristics would be immoral as well because it has that future. Okay, so now, what are the implications of this argument? Okay, the most important implication gives us an insight for the abortion debate. And the primary reason why it's wrong to kill an adult human also gives reason to think that abortion is prima facie wrong. And so that's the most significant thing, right? That when you, when you ponder why it's wrong to kill an adult human, you see that it's the deprivation of a future like ours. That explains a lot of things. It makes sense. And yet, when you apply it to abortion, certainly the fetus would have a future like ours in the sense of it would have plans and desires and hopes and things that are enjoyable in life. And so that's why it's wrong to have an abortion, says Marquis. Now, this position is compatible, he clarifies, with active euthanasia, and we will uh, be talking about that in, in the uh, next section. Um, but uh, it's compatible if you think that active euthanasia is morally acceptable, you could see that this argument for abortion would allow that, though the position certainly doesn't imply that euthanasia is always morally permissible. So Marquis says it doesn't, uh, 
restrict one's views uh, on that topic. He also clarifies a couple things. He says that this view does not imply that contraception is wrong. An egg or a spermatozoa does not have a future like ours. And so there's no reason to think that contraception would be wrong. And he notes that this view does not appeal to religious beliefs of any kind. It does not appeal to religious authority. And the idea there, of course, in the back of uh, our minds might be that it's religious views that drive people to be pro-life or against abortion. And Marquis is saying, look, there's been no appeal made to any religious belief or religious authority. So it's a purely, we might say, philosophical argument. Now, a clarification on the implication regarding um, abortion. The account provides a sufficient, but not a necessary condition for the wrongfulness of killing. In other words, it says when you deprive someone of a future like ours, that is sufficient on its own to say that the killing is immoral. But it may not be uh, a necessary condition, and as we've already alluded to, the fact that it harms the perpetrator, or the fact that it harms other people who care about the victim, makes um, killing could make killing wrong as well. Um, so there are other aspects to it. He acknowledges that, but the key here is if it's sufficient, it does do the work that he wants it to do in the argument. Marquis then considers a couple objections. Um, the first objection is that maybe there's a better way to explain the wrongfulness of killing an adult. So other philosophers have provided some other reasons for thinking it's wrong to kill an adult. So for example, uh, some would argue people value the experience of living and it's wrong to discontinue this experience because the individual values it. Now that looks promising, Marquis acknowledges, this might sound plausible, but it would be problematic though, still in the cases of the temporarily comatose who don't value the experience of living because they don't value anything. Or a temporary depression with suicidal thoughts. Somebody uh, might go through a phase where they are having suicidal thoughts and they're just not valuing their experience of living. That doesn't mean that we should we would be able to kill such a person with impunity. It would still be morally wrong, in other words, to kill such a person. It would still be morally wrong to terminate the life of somebody who's just temporarily comatose. A future, a person may have a valuable future, even if the person does not value their own future. So for example, um, that might, they might create, invent, love, et cetera, in ways that are extremely valuable to other people. So there might be a valuable future, even if the person temporarily or even long-term doesn't value their own future. And uh, so it doesn't mean that if you lack that value of life, if one doesn't value their own life, it doesn't mean that that would be morally permissible to kill them. And so this is a, a unsuccessful path to take to justify the morality of abortion. A second ob objection that Marquis considers is that maybe there's another way to explain the wrongfulness of killing an adult. It violates a fundamental desire to live. So this is a little bit different because it's not talking about valuing, it's just a simple focus on a desire to live. And, uh, and philosopher Peter Singer has an account of animal rights that takes this route that if something has a desire to live, it's wrong to terminate the life of that thing. Well, we might still think it's wrong to deprive someone of their life, even if they lack a desire to live. While you're asleep, it's not like you have this desire to live if you're in a deep sleep. When you're in an altered mood, sometimes uh, through uh, drugs or alcohol, somebody may think my life's not 
I, I don't desire to live anymore. I just want to die. But it's temporary. Or when somebody is temporarily suicidal and they, they think that, well, uh, my life isn't worth living, so I, I might want to kill myself. But it's often temporary. And so uh, that doesn't mean it would be morally acceptable to kill such a person in those states. So that's not what makes it uh, the, the big reason why it's wrong to kill an adult if they have those desires, because lacking those desires, it would still be wrong to kill an adult. And of course, Marquis would say, why? It would still be wrong. Um, if somebody doesn't value their life, the first objection, or somebody doesn't have a desire to live, because it would deprive that person of a future like ours. That's why it would be wrong. Okay, conclusion, and we now can put this all together and make, make it a clear, succinct argument of Marquis. Fetuses possess a property that makes it morally wrong to kill them. What is that property? This property is the same property that is at the heart of what makes it morally wrong to kill an adult human. That is, being deprived of having a future like ours. Fetus has that property. That's what makes it wrong to kill an adult human. Therefore, abortion is morally wrong. 